Hello to everybody listening into this webcast, wherever you are. Uh, I'm Anton Pozniak. I'm a physician uh, in HIV medicine at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. And my co-chair is Professor Alexandra Kalmi from Geneva in Switzerland. I'd like to thank you for joining and making the time from your busy days to listen to the opening of this COVID-19 online educational program, which we hope to have at regular intervals to keep you updated around this uh, pandemic. Um, firstly, I'd like to uh, offer our solidarity with all of you on the front line and all of you supporting uh, friends, family and loved ones who might be affected by this disease. Before we start, let me just give you some practicalities. Uh, there's a large number of attendees, so everyone's muted. So if you want to submit a question, there is a function in Zoom called chat, and you can write your questions in there, and we will be analyzing this in, uh, in real time. Now, anyone who experiences technical difficulties with the program, it's going to be recorded and made available uh, uh, online for you, so you can watch that afterwards. Now, why are we doing this program? Because things are really changing and everybody wants to know uh, what's happening. There are lots of questions flying around. There are lots of things that are unknown, but we are making progress. And I think that uh, one of the most important things that we can do as a faculty is try and um, expose the areas of, of knowledge that we know and also explore those areas that we don't know. So in the next 90 minutes, you're going to have a program of um, lectures followed by some uh, brief questions. And then at the end, we're going to have a question time to try and answer those things that you're putting in online. And hopefully after this, you'll be clearer about uh, a lot of the aspects from epidemiology all the way through to treatment around COVID-19 and also give us an idea about where we should uh, be focusing this um, program next. Next slide. So, uh, as I've said, my co chair is Alexandra Kalmi uh, from Geneva University Hospital in Switzerland. And you can see here the program directors Charles Boucher from Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands, Jonathan Shapiro from Israel, and Stefano Vella uh, from Italy, uh, which has been one of the most heavily affected countries, as you all know by the COVID. I'd like to thank them all for putting uh, together this program. Uh, next slide, please. Um, today's program uh, is going to, we're going to start with the epidemiology of COVID-19 pandemic. We're then going to talk about something that I think everybody uh, is uh, talking about, which is um, about testing. And that's a, a really interesting um, part of the of this COVID-19 epidemic is about testing. Therapeutics, you've heard even HIV drugs being repurposed for therapeutics, but it's an expanding um, area. And then we've got clinical experience. And Stefano Vella is uh, setting up a hospital in Sardinia for COVID. And, um, and, and that's really important uh, part of the development for what Italy's doing. And um, we're going to hear from him about clinical experience. So next slide. So it's with great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Elliot Raises, uh, who's going to talk about the epidemiology of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Elliot works for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. And in a, in a previous life, not, long, not, not many months ago, he was uh, uh, helping with the rollout uh, of antiretroviral uh, agents throughout the whole of Africa. Uh, uh, Elliot, um, has had a long experience in uh, viral illnesses and now is responsible for some of the elements around the COVID-19 pandemic and preparedness. So Elliot, um, please over to you for your lecture. Good day to you all. My name is Elliot Raises from the CDC in the US and I'm pleased to open what I hope will be an informative and helpful uh, symposium on the COVID-19 pandemic. Coronavirus, or COVIDs for short, are a large family of viruses. Of the seven COVID known to cause human disease, 
or generally cause mild illness like the common cold. However, three of these pathogens, all beta CoVs, can cause lethal human disease. These include SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, and now SARS-CoV-2. It's important to understand that we use the term COVID-19 to describe the illness caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2 because it is genetically more like SARS-CoV than MERS-CoV. COVID-19 appears to have been first recognized as a human illness in late 2019. We don't know, yet know exactly when, how, or where this virus arose. We believe it represents a cross-species transmission from an animal reservoir, very likely bats. It may have been involved as a, they may have been involved as an intermediary animal host. Most of the early cases, but not all, were linked to a market in the city of Wuhan in Hubei province. However, during January 2020, cases rapidly spread to people with no known exposure to this market, presumably through person-to-person -person contact outside the market, and that amplified the outbreak. By mid-January, COVID-19 had been confirmed in almost every province in mainland China, with the greatest number of cases in Hubei province, the darkest pink area in this map, centered within the province's capital and most populous city. That, this figure shows daily numbers of new cases reported from China, which is shown in green, and from all countries outside of China, shown in yellow, as of March 5th. Early in this pandemic, spread of COVID-19 was limited mostly to China, with two large increases in mid-January that were actually related to a change in the Chinese case transmission. However, as of February 25th, the daily number of new cases outside China now exceeds those within China, from March 4th onward, the number of daily deaths from COVID-19 occurring outside China have exceeded the number within China. By early March, COVID-19 had spread to other parts of the world with remarkable speed. And almost all countries have reported cases with the most recent increase in reporting countries in the Americas and Africa. As you can see from this epi curve, Europe and the Americas are reporting the vast majority of daily new cases. However, in Africa, testing capacity, the ability to implement social distancing measures, especially in crowded urban areas with informal settlements, and the decreased capacity to manage critically ill patients in many of these countries are all causes for significant concern. Now I'd like to move on to describe some of the data we know about the clinical epidemiology and transmission of COVID. To give you a sense of the relative frequency of the major signs and symptoms observed with COVID-19, I am showing here these data from three reports describing hospitalized patients in China. More than 80% of patients develop fever during illness. Over half develop cough and about 25% of myalgia are arthralgia with a small fraction developing headache or diarrhea. Although fever is the predominant sign of illness, one report observed a much lower prevalence of fever at presentation of only 44%, even though most of these patients eventually developed fever. Shortness of breath at presentation even among hospital patients, hospitalized patients, does not appear to be as common as perhaps originally would. These signs and symptoms of COVID-19 are consistent with what we often call flu-like illness. Unfortunately, at this time, no particular set of signs or symptoms or related clinical findings can reliably clinically discriminate COVID-19 from other respiratory viral illnesses, such as influenza. Most people present with subacute or acute onset of cough and fever. Fever may be measurable, but as I noted earlier, not all patients have a measurable fever present. And they may describe, although they may describe feeling feverish and then later go on to develop actual. I also want to highlight that there are some reports of persons presenting with isolated GI illness, specifically diarrhea, that has preceded the development of cough and fever by a day or two, in addition to some recent reports of loss of smell and or taste as an early person. 
In terms of the age distribution of persons with COVID-19, these data from the largest Chinese surveillance report to date show that most patients have been middle-aged adults who also comprise a large part of the dental population. I want to make special note of what may appear to be very limited amount of SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 illness in children. Some reports do suggest that children are equally susceptible to COVID-19 as adults, at least as adults under age 50. If true, then the data presented here likely represents underreporting of the epidemic. This kind of underreporting may be due to a decreased likelihood that children will present for clinical care because we know they experience milder disease than adults. Adults, especially adults over age 60, experience significantly more severe COVID-19 illness and are more likely to die as reflected by these case fatality rates, or CFRs, shown by the yellow line and y-axis to the right. In the US, the most recent mortality data suggests that 9% of deaths due to COVID-19 are, however, in persons less than 55. A number of factors can affect the CFR, such as the number of people tested. In outbreaks, the most evidently ill person with a higher risk of death tends to be tested first. As more people with less severe disease are tested, the increasing number of total cases will include more survivors and thereby lower the CFR. In addition, how, how many people die depends on how quickly illness is recognized and how well it can be managed. Deaths will be higher where sufficient life standing support is lacking. The current best estimate, which admittedly is a large range of present, is that the case fatality rate is likely somewhere between 0.5 and 3.5%. By comparison, CFR for seasonal influenza, at least in the United States, is about 0.1%, meaning that COVID-19 could be five to 35 times more deadly than seasonal flu. Despite the important concerns about case fatality rates, most COVID-19 illnesses are, and we expect will continue to be, mild, and most patients will recover spontaneously with some supportive care, especially children and middle-aged adults. In the United States, based on data coming from 14 states participating in our surveillance network, hospitalization rates increase significantly by age. Respiratory secretions are the main mode of COVID-19 transmission. An infection is spread through respiratory droplets in the air and that land on surfaces. Exposure to infected stool or feces may transmit some infection, but at this time does not appear to be a major contributor to new illnesses. Although SARS-CoV-2 RNA is readily detectable by RT-PCR and feces, from persons with COVID-19, there was only one report of replication competent virus having been cultured from stool, and there has not been clear evidence of infection spread sol solely by exposure to infected feces. Recommended infection control practices for managing feces should pro provide substantial protection against infection through stool exposure. Perinatal transmission in its purest sense has not yet been observed. SARS-CoV-2 RNA has not been detected by RT-PCR and amniotic fluid, cord blood, neonatal throat swab, or breast milk. We also know that the amount of virus shed from the respiratory tract of infected and ill people is greatest at the time symptoms start, and then it declines. What this means exactly in terms of the presence of infectious virus has yet to be fully worked out and is a major focus of our work with CDC. For those of you familiar with HIV viral load but new to CT values, think of them as the inverse of each other. CT values, or cycle thresholds, represent the number of PCR cycles it takes for the test to detect the presence of viral RNA. So in this case, a lower CT value means it took less time and therefore more viral RNA was present in the sample. So lower CT values correspond to higher levels of virus, hence the configuration of the y-axis as you see here.
We are also gathering increasing evidence of transmission in the pre-symptomatic or even asymptomatic phase of illness. In a study in Singapore, we had seven epidemiologic clusters which were identified and, and we had likely occurrence of pre-symptomatic transmission for 10 cases. And these, case, these cases tended to uh, have symptoms occur about one to three days after the test was performed. Also in the Kings County out near in Seattle uh, nursing home outbreak, 13 of 23 patients who tested positive for COVID-19 infection were asymptomatic at the time of the test. And 10 of those 13 then developed symptoms within seven days of that positive test. And modeling suggests that this mode of spread could be even more significant than originally thought. This recently published model simu simulated outbreak spreads in China under two scenarios with different, differing transmission rates from undocumented infections. The red bars is the evolution of cases in a hypothetical outbreak using estimated per individual infectiousness for persons that is half the efficiency of documented, whereas the blue is the same hypothetical outbreak but assumes that undocumented infections are not contagious. You can see that the red curves seem to be similar to what most countries are experiencing. In a, in a recent uh, publication, we put out on outcomes by underlying health conditions in COVID-19 patients here in the United States. We were able to evaluate over 7,000 cases. And what we found that was that 71% of the hospitalized and 78% of the ICU admissions had one or more designated underlying conditions with the most common conditions being diabetes, chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease, immunocompromised condition, and chronic renal disease, whereas only 29% of hospitalized and 22% of ICU admissions had, had no, none of the designated As you will likely hear from the clinical presentation, lymphopenia has been observed in hospitalized patients, though it is still not clear if that increases the risk of poor outcome in the setting of HIV. Nonetheless, we should all take precautions given this is a new illness. Pregnancy, um, with current observational data, shows only is only for women in third, in fact, in the third trimester, and it appears thus far that maternal mortality is similar with, as I said earlier, no infection transmitted to patients, at least documented. Finally, I think, I think this recent uh, paper by Lipsitch in the New England Journal does a good job of summarizing what some of the key epidemiology questions we're gonna to need to try to answer um, as we move forward with both the uh, management and the investigation of this uh, pandemic. As we are dealing with the strain on our healthcare system, we are also trying to gather as much information as possible to inform our mitigation strategies along with future containment. In the US, we want sicker patients to seek hospital care while those with mild illness self-manage at home to reduce the strain in the healthcare system and our PPE supply. The challenge is, the challenge is coming up with proper screening tools to differentiate. Zero prevalence surveys of households and communities are now being performed to help determine the prevalence of asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic illness among persons who have never been tested for COVID-19 using PCR to help inform many of these questions along with studies. Further studies on viral shedding also will be needed to better determine infectiousness during recovery and from surfaces, just to name a few benefits of those studies. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your comments and questions following the excellent presentations to follow. And most of all, thank you for all the heroic work you do on the front lines. This is an unprecedented global health challenge. Thanks, Elliot, um, for that excellent review of the epidemiology.
And um, I, I'd like to ask you some questions, if I may, that come in from the audience. So the, the first is, why do you think more men are at risk than, than, than women? Okay. Um, that's, I think, I think uh, as I sort of summarized in my last slide, I do think that there's a lot of difficult questions that's still unanswered, a lot of observations that we're making that the exact cause still needs to be answered. So I think we are seeing more men in terms of the way in which we are um, identifying the disease because of hospitalizations. Um, and, and so I think as we get more data on all infections, not just infections that lead to hospitalizations, I think we will better be able to figure out how real this phenomenon is and also try to evaluate other co-founders co such as hypertension or other chronic diseases that might be affecting um, the data coming in from men. So I think some of the studies that we're gonna need to do both with serology and PCR will answer that. So I'm reluctant to hypothesize on that right now, but I do think that we need to try to sort that out for sure. Uh, and there's another question. It, uh, there's lots of countries in the world where the demographics are much more young people than older people. Mm -hmm. And uh, do we have any data handle on that, whether or not the sort of um, percentage of older people are, are, are being affected as much as elsewhere? Because obviously in Italy, it seems to have affected, the, the demographics are they've got a large elderly population and they've been hit hard. But do we have any data on, on, demogra on the effects of this epidemic on countries where the demographics are quite different? Well, I do think that at this point, I'm not sure about if it's a function of the demographic differences, but we are seeing more severe cases even in the United States than, than we've seen reported in China. That's, that's going to be of interest uh, moving forward as we look into this um, a little further. I think that, again, it's sort of the same answer as with the men. I think until we have a better handle on asymptomatic infections, mildly symptomatic infections, which is probably in the end going to require serological surveys, sero surveys rather than just uh, PCR-based uh, testing. I think we're going to we're going to need we're going to need to get a better handle on that. But um, I would certainly I think originally we maybe we're uh, operating under the paradigm that younger people do not need to be worried about this disease. But I definitely think that the data coming in more recently suggests that. We cannot be so um, complacent when it comes to uh, morbidity and even mortality in these younger populations. Thanks. And just quickly, uh, your thoughts about wearing masks and uh, as because of airborne transmission. We've now we've now seen uh, WHO some WHO guidance released today about mask mm -hmm. wearing, and I just wonder whether you wanted to quickly note so, that. At least from the standpoint of CDC, I think what, what, we're, what we're putting forward as the rationale behind the potential for universal masking, um, in the, especially in the public uh, sphere, is more about uh, the, the, the data that we're now starting to see and is becoming increasingly troubling regarding pre-symptomatic or even asymptomatic infection and shedding during that period. What's interesting is that when you go to the you know, when you go out in public and you see people wearing masks now, or you were like two, three weeks ago before some of these guidances came down, were they doing it to protect themselves or were they doing it to protect others? I think it probably varies from culture to culture, but I think what we're trying to do is make a, a universal culture that people wearing masks in the public are actually doing it because they themselves may be in that shedding phase and it really is needs to be about protecting. Fascinating. Well, thank you very much for excellent talk, and we'll come back to you during the uh, roundtable questions uh, at the end of this um, webinar. So it's a great pleasure now to introduce uh, Alexandra Kalmi, um, uh, my co-chair. Thank you very much, uh, Anton. Um, it was really a great talk. So now I would like to introduce Anne Geneviève Marcelin. She will talk about the testing for SARS-CoV-2 infection. Anne Geneviève Marcelin is a professor of medicine at Sorbonne U University in Paris. Um, and Paris is a heavily hit uh, city uh, by COVID-19. So it's a great pleasure uh, to have here a clinical vi virologist to explain her experience. Uh, professor Marcelin's research interest inclu includes post-HIV mechanisms of resistance to antiretrovirals 
also new therapy strategies for HIV treatment and new antiretroviral agents. She's a, a member of the Agence Nationale de Recherche sur le SIDA, and she's the chair of the INRS Next Generation Sequencing Network. So it's our pleasure uh, now to listen to Anne talking about testing strategies. My name is uh, Anne Geneviève Marcelin. I'm a virologist uh, in the Pitié Salpêtrière Hospital in France, and I will speak about uh, testing for SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. Here are my disclosures. Um, so, um, coronaviruses repeatedly crossed species barrier. There are four uh, genera that exist, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma coronavirus. Uh, bats and rodents are the gene source of most alpha and beta uh, code. So to date, this co uh, coronavirus species uh, were known to cause human disease, um, <clears throat> alpha coronavirus and beta coronaviruses. And um, some of them are uh, associated with uh, self-limiting upper respiratory infections. Uh, however, um, others are uh, associated with a severe uh, lower respiratory tract infection with a severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, such as uh, SARS-CoV and uh, MERS-CoV. Uh, so in late December uh, 2019, uh, cases of severe pneumonia were reported. They were epidemiologically uh, associated with a seafood market in uh, China. And the uh, unknown etiologic agent was uh, finally identified. Um, so this is uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, the virus uh, is an enveloped virus with a spike protein that mediated uh, attachment to the host cell. And uh, as you can see, the genome is a positive sense uh, single-stranded RNA, um, which is uh, uh, 30 uh, kilobase. Um, the whole genome uh, of the virus has been sequenced. And uh, this uh, genome shows 88% uh, of identity with bat-derived uh, uh, coronavirus, 79% uh, with uh, SARS-CoV, and about 50% uh, with uh, MERS-CoV. So it is important to know um, about the postulated pathogenesis of uh, this uh, virus. Um, uh, bec um, after the contact and the transmission of the virus through uh, uh, respiratory droplets and, and contacts, the, the, the virus is mainly located um, in the upper uh, respiratory tract, in the nasal cavity and the pharynx at the beginning of the disease, and then the, the virus is going down to the lower respiratory tract and uh, also in the gastrointestinal uh, mucosa. So uh, regarding the state of the, of the disease, is, um, it is very important to, to know where the virus can be uh, to adapt our uh, diagnostic uh, strategy. Uh, so very rapidly, um, a German team from uh, uh, Berlin, uh, Hôpital La Charité, um, has developed um, real-time RT-PCR to uh, detect this novel coronavirus. Uh, they established and validate a diagnostic workflow for this virus screening and a specific confirmation. confirmation. So they, de they develop uh, several uh, primers and probes uh, to amplify uh, different regions uh, in, um, in, uh, the, in this, the N gene uh, part, the E uh, gene part, and the polymerase part. And so the, um, the recommendation uh, was to use uh, first the E gene uh, assay as a first line screening tool, followed by a confirmatory testing with the polymerase uh, gene assay. So uh, many laboratories now uh, used this uh, protocol. And at the beginning, uh, it, um, this, um, this testing was uh, uh, essentially uh, through a manual uh, technique. But now uh, we have also a high throughput uh, machine um, that allowed to perform um, 
uh, a lot of tests per day, uh, 100 and so even 1,000 tests per day. So uh, where we can find uh, the, the virus, um, so it essentially in the respiratory uh, specimens and uh, in this uh, retrospective study, including uh, 205 patients, 19% uh, of them had a severe illness. Uh, in this study, um, the authors um, evaluate the, per, uh, the, the positive uh, PCR test, the percentage of positive tests, uh, between different resp respiratory samples. And they showed that uh, the bronchoalveolar leverage fluid specimens uh, showed uh, the, highest, the highest positivity rest with uh, 93%, uh, followed by a sputum uh, in 72% of cases, and then uh, the nasal Schwabs uh, with 63%. Uh, uh, as you can see in the pharyngeal Schwabs, only 32% of uh, specimens were, uh, were positive. Uh, they detected a uh, sometimes also some uh, RNA uh, in the faces. So this shows that uh, um, the, the lower um, specimens were, uh, uh, were more, more uh, sensitive than the upper uh, specimen. Uh, in this uh, retrospective study, including uh, uh, 92 patients, uh, they showed that the peak of the viral load uh, was at five, six days after symptoms here, and that generally uh, sputum showed a higher viral load uh, than, um, than the uh, throat uh, samples. And this has been confirmed in other uh, studies, showing that uh, the viral load in sputum is higher than in uh, throat and nasal swabs. So now if we look at the follow-up of the RT-PCRs in infected patients, uh, in this prospective study, including 67 uh, COVID patients, uh, they, they, they showed that uh, the median duration of RNA SARS-CoV-2 shedding um, was uh, 12 days uh, for uh, nasopharyngeal uh, swabs here, uh, 19 days uh, for sputum and 18 days uh, in, in, in stool uh, samples. They were also able to uh, detect some uh, positive RNA in uh, urines and, and plasma. However, it, it's, uh, it's important to, to know if uh, the virus that we detect in, the, in these uh, respiratory samples are uh, uh, infectious viruses or not. So this is a very uh, elegant study uh, published recently in Nature, and they published a detailed uh, virological analysis of nine cases, uh, providing proof of uh, active virus replication in upper respiratory, respiratory tract tissues. Uh, indeed, the pharyngeal virus shedding was very high during the first week of symptoms, and uh, interestingly, uh, they showed that infectious virus was isolated in 93% of samples during the first uh, seven days from uh, throat and lung uh, samples, but never uh, after uh, seven days. And uh, very interestingly, they showed that there, are, there was no infectious virus uh, isolated uh, from stool samples. Um, they also showed that the serum conversion occurred after seven days in 50% of patients, uh, 14 days in all, uh, but was not followed by a rapid uh, decline in, in viral load. So this, uh, this study showed that uh, uh, during the first phase of the uh, disease, uh, patients uh, are, uh, are uh, contagious and can uh, transmit the, the virus from the uh, from the um, respiratory samples. Uh, so now if we look at the uh, relationship between the viral load and sev uh, disease severity, uh, this prospective study uh, containing in uh, 76 patients um, showed that in an, uh, they followed uh, nasopharyngeal samples from patients they studied uh, 30 uh, severe cases and 46 mild uh, cases. 
and uh, um, the, 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 the viral load was uh, expressed as a CT. Uh, so you, you have to keep in mind that when the CT is uh, high, um, the viral load uh, is, um, is low. So they, they showed that uh, when they compared mild and severe cases, the mean viral load of severe cases was, uh, was higher uh, than uh, mild cases. Uh, 60 times uh, higher than uh, mild cases. And 90% uh, uh, of mild cases were repeatedly tested uh, negative on RT-PCR by uh, 10, uh, 10 days post onset. And by contrast, uh, all severe cases were still tested positive at or beyond day 10 post onset. So similar to SARS-CoV, uh, uh, patients with severe uh, COVID-19 tend to have a high viral load and a long virus uh, shedding uh, period. So uh, beside the, the molecular diagnostic, um, there are a, a lot of hope with uh, sero serological assays. Uh, in this prospective study, including 173 patients with, uh, um, with uh, uh, followed uh, plasma samples, um, the, the authors enrolled patients with confirmed uh, SARS-CoV infection by RT-PCR, and they studied the, uh, the, the total antibodies, uh, IgM and IgG by ELISA. And the assays they use showed a, a good specificity. And uh, they, they, sh they, they showed that the median time of uh, serum conversion in these uh, infected patients uh, was um, 11 days for total antibodies, uh, 12 days for IgM, and 14 days for IgG. Uh, the presence of antibodies um, was less than 40% within first week since onset and then increase to 100% uh, uh, since day 15 after onset for uh, total antibodies. Um, it is interesting to, to this analysis is interesting because they combined uh, uh, RNA and antibody, det antibody detections. Um, and this can um, improve uh, significantly the sensitivity of the diagnosis of COVID, uh, even in the early phase on, um, uh, even in the early phase of one uh, week since, uh, since onset. As you can see, uh, when combining uh, uh, RNA plus antibodies, uh, the sensitivity uh, is quite uh, very good, uh, around 100%. So, uh, in conclusions, um, um, the diagnosis uh, of um, SARS-CoV-2 infection is mainly done by a real-time RT-PCR. It's recommended in symptomatic patients um, with uh, respiratory, un respiratory uh, specimens. We have now um, uh, various uh, techniques to do that, uh, either manual or uh, with high throughput systems. Uh, but we have to, to, to keep in mind that the sensitivity depends uh, on the quality of the type of samples and the disease, disease stage. Um, and we have approximately 30% uh, of false negative. So there, there are a lot of uh, hope with the serological assays. And many, many tests are under development. Uh, either RAPID or uh, ELISA, but we absolutely need for a performance evaluation of this test uh, with EGA, IGA, M or G. Uh, several studies show that the median time of serocovation is about uh, 14 uh, days, but we don't know yet uh, what is the persistence of these uh, antibodies. And there are some remaining questions, for example, um, uh, the, the, what is the time of serial convention between uh, uh, severe symptomatic or post-symptomatic patients? Um, there are some data suggesting that maybe post-symptomatic patients are, have longer uh, time uh, to serial conversion. Uh, we, 
we don't not we don't have yet some uh, a lot of data about the neutralization of these uh, antibodies and their capacity to protect from uh, from uh, infection. Um, however, uh, there, there are some indications that could be uh, very interesting for the use of these uh, serological assays, of course, uh, for epidemiological studies, uh, but also um, for uh, it could be maybe interesting to combine uh, these tests with RT-PCR for acute infection diagnosis. Uh, and it's, it would be also interesting to, uh, to use these tests for uh, past infection diagnosis. For for example, in asymptomatic patients and uh, also for healthcare uh, workers. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention and uh, we will discuss uh, that uh, with pleasure after. Thank you very much, um, Anne Genevieve. Um, I think it was extremely interesting even for non-virologists to hear about your overview. Um, I think we all realize how uh, difficult it is to diagnose this disease so efficiently as there is a relatively low uh, sensitivity of the upper, re uh, specimen, uh, upper respiratory specimens uh, with the swab to detect SARS-CoV-2 infections. So I was wondering what you would like to propose. Are you advocating for um, a different uh, swab specimens, not only upper respiratory tract? Are you um, asking us to make a different swab also in lower respiratory um, tracts? Are you advocating for the time, uh, different timing issues or to, for a combination of antibody and PCR tests to really diagnose the, the disease? And I think all clinicians have been uh, have seen patients uh, like I, I saw a patient uh, who was 27 years old was tested three times for the upper respiratory um, RT PCR that was negative, and when he was intubated at the intensive care, then we realized it was uh, positive from the uh, after the intubation specimens. So we are really interested to know how to do to improve the sensitivity of, of those um, RT-PCR tests. Uh, yes, we, we have all uh, this uh, experience with some patients uh, with uh, repeatedly negative tests and with obviously uh, uh, COVID-like symptoms and uh, also uh, sometimes some uh, uh, CT uh, chest uh, positive. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, what we what we are doing, for example, in in France, and we are um, um, primarily uh, doing um, nasopharyngeal swabs. But in case uh, of negative results and some uh, other um, uh, other um, um, strong arguments for a COVID infection, we are going to we we try to um, to have some um, lower um, samples. And uh, sometimes some patients are classified COVID only on the CT chest. But uh, um, it was in my conclusion, but I think that uh, maybe the, with the serological test, we could uh, enhance the sensitivity of the diagnosis. But um, at this time, we don't have yet very good, uh, a very good test for serology, and we are performing some evaluation to, to find the good, the good test. Yeah, I was wondering whether the sputum, uh, as you showed in one of your slides, seems to be much better than the nasopharyngeal swab. So, but we don't use routinely sputum uh, PCR detection in sputum. Why is that so? Actually, we do that for TB, for example, with not much issues. Um, mm -hmm. I was just surprised from your slide showing such a better detection in sputum yeah. than in the, the swab, nasopharyngeal swab. Can you explain on that? Maybe it, this is um, the, the location of the virus. Uh, as, I, as I say, that the, uh, the, the virus is going down, so maybe it's, um, there is more, um, more virus uh, in, in sputum than in the nasopharyngeal swabs. Yeah. From what I see in my hospital, it's not so easy to ask uh, induced sputum because yes, people yes. are really afraid uh, yes. of doing those sputum. So it might explain why we, we're quite reluctant to go into deeper, uh, different locations for swabs. Yeah, yes, I, I agree. It, um, it's more difficult to obtain. Uh, sometimes it's some patients uh, 
cannot uh, uh, have induced a sputum. And uh, also, um, uh, for, the for the risk of transmission, uh, it's um, more risky to, to do this kind of uh, sampling um, in comparison to nas nasopharyngeal swabs because you, you can have some aerosols and so it's more risky for uh, transmission. I had a last, last question, if I may. Um, the last question is, you mentioned that we don't yet know about whether having uh, antibodies may protect you from an, another infection. How will we know that? Do we have to wait for the end of the epidemic one day before we know that? Or how are you trying to answer this question? And no, I think we, we, can, we can ask that before the, the, the end of the uh, of the epidemic because you know that there are some tests uh, these tests are um, uh, sero neutralization of um, you you and you can test the the, the, the affinity and uh, the ability of uh, of these antibodies to uh, to be productive so we, so we we have some tests to to do that so i think we we will have soon uh, this uh, this, answer, this answer. Thank you very much, Anjan Viev. It was really a great overview of a difficult topics. And I would like to thank you. And now I give the, the speech to Anton. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Uh, thank you very much for an excellent talk and thank you. And now we're moving to therapeutics for COVID-19. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Dan Koritskis, who most of you know probably from his uh, fantastic work he's done with HIV. He's the professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and uh, Chief of the Division of Infectious Disease at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And of course, we all know that uh, the epidemic of COVID-19 is now uh, taking off uh, in the USA. Dan has a, an encyclopedic knowledge of uh, therapeutics for COVID-19. And I'm looking very much to your, to, towards your talk, Dan. It's over to you. There's tremendous interest in therapeutics for COVID-19 a viral infection for which we have no proven therapies. In this talk, I will discuss different potential options for treatment of COVID-19. These are my disclosures. And this is an outline for my talk. I'll review briefly uh, how successful we've been in developing antiviral therapies for uh, viral infections over the last uh, uh, 40 or 50 years and where we stand today. Talk about which avenues for therapeutic intervention exist for COVID-19, and then review the data on antivirals, immune response modifiers, inhibitors of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, the potential use of convalescence serum, challenges in conducting drug trials in viral respiratory infections, and end with a brief discussion of the possibility of post-exposure post prophylaxis. We've really been enormously successful in developing therapy for a variety of viral illnesses since uh, the dawn of the AIDS era in the early 1980s, at which point we had very few antiviral drugs. Uh, when AIDS uh, first hit, we only had a cyclovir for herpes virus infection, the adamantanes for influenza, and then ribavirin had some very limited uses. But there's been the rapid development of novel antiviral and antiretroviral drugs uh, uh, over the last uh, 40 years. We now have more than 30 approved antiretroviral drugs and drug combinations. We've seen a spate of uh, novel drugs approved for the treatment of the herpes simplex virus and uh, varicella zoster virus, as well as new drugs for the treatment of cytomegalovirus. In addition, beyond the adamantanes, which are no longer used, we have numerous uh, drugs for the treatment of influenza, including the neuraminidase inhibitors, and most recently, approval of a cap-dependent and a nuclease inhibitor. And uh, on the immunological front, we have the use of broadly neutralizing antibodies for Ebola. So there's every reason to be optimistic that in the next months or year, uh, we could find effective therapy for uh, SARS-CoV-2, the agent of coronavirus infectious disease uh, 2019. Well, what are some of those treatment options? We might use antiviral drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, as well as convalescent serum. So let's go through these systematically. 
The first antiviral drugs to be considered included the protease inhibitors that are used for treatment of HIV, uh, particularly lopinavir ritonavir. Now, this seems a bit puzzling since uh, the protease inhibitors for HIV are aspartyl acid proteases, whereas the proteases of SARS-CoV-2 are serine proteases. And generally speaking, HIV proteases show exquisite uh, uh, specificity uh, for the HIV protease. But there was some evidence from a retrospective case control series uh, suggesting the benefit of uh, boosted lopinavir in the original SARS epidemic of more than a decade ago, and evidence from in vitro studies of modest activity of lopinavir against the current SARS-CoV-2. Now that's shown in this upper uh, right-hand panel here, where you see with an EC50 of just under 12 micromolar, uh, you can get uh, complete inhibition of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 with uh, lopinavir. So uh, a randomized clinical trial was conducted in China that uh, took patients who had uh, severe COVID-19 disease and randomized them either to lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, or control, and found no benefit overall in terms of uh, the cumulative rate of improvement as assessed by a variety of parameters. One intriguing finding in that study, however, was that in the subgroup of individuals treated early in infection before 12 days of illness, there was a signal that there might be a benefit. And so the door is not completely closed yet on the potential utility of the boosted PIs for treatment of COVID-19. There's considerable interest in the use of hydroxychloroquine, a drug that has gotten uh, a lot of attention in the press. Hydroxychloroquine, which is a derivative of chloroquine, drug used for uh, centuries now for the treatment of malaria, uh, is approved for the treatment of rheumatologic diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus sarcomatosis. There are two potential modes of action for hydroxychloroquine against COVID-19. One as a direct antiviral, because the drug inhibits the acidification of endosomal and phagocytic vesicles, uh, which are the pathway for virus entry. And secondly, as a potential anti-inflammatory drug that may diminish uh, inflammation in the lung. In vitro studies show that both chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine inhibit SARS-CoV-2 uh, with an IC50 of uh, approximately 4 micromolar uh, at the multiplicity of infection of uh, 0.02 infectious uh, units uh, per, uh, per culture. There have been mixed results from a series of small, mostly uh, uncontrolled clinical trials, and one intriguing study that uh, examined the uh, rate of positivity uh, in uh, oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal swabs uh, from individuals who were hospitalized for a, a SARS-CoV-2 infection and received either hydroxychloroquine alone, shown in the blue line, or hydroxychloroquine uh, plus azithromycin as shown in the green line as compared to controls. A major limitation of this study, aside from the fact that it wasn't a randomized uh, or blinded study, uh, is that uh, several of the patients actually had progressive disease and were uh, intubated and uh, admitted to the intensive care unit, at which time they were no longer being sampled, uh, and that uh, creates a certain amount of bias. Nevertheless, there is uh, uh, enough interest in this approach that there are now several uh, large clinical trials being proposed, either of hydroxychloroquine or of hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin uh, for the treatment of patients with uh, COVID-19. Remdesivir is an RNA polymerase inhibitor uh, with in vitro activity against a number of RNA viruses, including Ebola, SARS, MERS, and SARS-CoV-2. The uh, upper right-hand panel shows the inhibition curve, and you can see that um, the uh, IC50 here uh, is much lower than what we saw previously for either hydroxychloroquine or for lopinavir. It's actually sub-micromolar, about 0.8 uh, micromolar. Uh, the, this drug was actually tested in phase three clinical trials against Ebola, so there's quite a lot known about its uh, safety in uh, human populations. Uh, unfortunately, it was inferior to uh, BNABs against Ebola, uh, which is a cautionary note in terms of what we might expect 
uh, of remdesivir in, uh, a hum uh, in the treatment of uh, COVID-19. On the more optimistic side, however, uh, this drug was quite effective against MERS in both murine and in non-human primate models. Uh, these uh, histological slides uh, show protection against lung injury uh, in uh, infected uh, rhesus macaques uh, treated with remdesivir as compared to those who were treated with uh, a control uh, infusion. You can see the extensive uh, amount of material, uh, intra-alveolar material and inflammatory cells here as compared to the remdesivir treated animals and then compared to the uninfected controls. Uh, in addition, uh, in the uh, macaque model, which also included uh, looking at um, uh, the preventive use of remdesivir, uh, there was a substantial reduction in uh, the amount of virus in respiratory secretions in the uh, treated animals uh, who uh, were treated after infection and substantial protection against acquisition of infection uh, when used in a prophylactic setting. Uh, there are now numerous uh, ongoing randomized clinical trials of remdesivir in both moderate and severe COVID-19 uh, uh, infection, and we look forward to the results of those trials. Favipiravir is a broad-spectrum viral RNA polymerase inhibitor that's approved for use against influenza in Japan, although it is not approved uh, in the United States and in uh, several other countries. This drug, uh, in contrast to what we saw for um, remdesivir, has a much higher EC50 in vitro, about 62 micromolar, but that is a concentration that is achievable uh, with uh, current dosing. Um, there have been non-randomized pilot studies showing faster clearance of SARS-CoV-2 in patients who received favipiravir compared to those who received boosted lopinavir, uh, as shown in this slide here. You can see the rapid the loss of, um, of positivity from uh, nasal swabs in the favipiravir group uh, compared to the lopinavir group. As a consequence, there are several trials that are either planned or underway uh, for this drug, uh, which is uh, well tolerated and whose pharmacokinetics are well understood. Leaving behind uh, specific antiviral drugs, there's a great interest in the potential role of this immune response modifiers. And that's because if we look at the pathogenesis and the clinical course of, of COVID-19, uh, there's an initial phase, phase of infection uh, that's characterized as early infection, which is really uh, when viral infection is predominating. Uh, that moves on to the pulmonary phase and then moves into a host inflammatory response phase. And it's this third hyperinflammatory phase that's accompanied by extensive lung injury in the 15 to 20% of individuals who develop a severe COVID-19. And it's in this setting I, that uh, antiviral therapy is uh, unlikely to offer additional uh, benefit, but where anti-inflammatory therapy may have a significant uh, utility. Uh, this second phase is characterized by generalized immune activation and so-called cytokine storms with very high levels of interleukin-6, and therefore monoclonal antibodies that block the IL-6, IL-6 receptor access may be effective in preventing or moderating immune-mediated lung injury. Pilot studies of tocilizumab, an IL-6 receptor blocker, show decreases in C-reactive protein, as shown in this panel here, uh, and uh, resolution of fever as shown in this uh, panel here. As a result, there are several clinical trials that are either planned or underway. Uh, one, a randomized study of tocilizumab, another study of cerilumab, uh, which is another IL-6 receptor antagonist, uh, and a study of zidecumab, uh, which is a um, IL-6 uh, antibody. SARS-CoV-2 gains entry into the cell by binding to the uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 uh, uh, molecule bound to the cell surface, and then is uh, engulfed in these endocytic vesicles uh, and gains entry uh, uh, into the cytoplasm from there. There's an interaction between uh, the um, renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and the ACE2 receptor, such that when, uh, uh, when this axis is uh, inhibited either by the use of uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme 1 inhibitors or angiotensin-2 receptor blockers, 
there is an increase in the level of ACE2 uh, expression on the cell surface. Now uh, that has raised some concern as to whether the use of um, <clears throat> these uh, uh, RAS inhibitors, as they're called, uh, may exacerbate uh, COVID-19. Um, by, uh, by contrast, SARS-CoV-2 infection itself downregulates uh, ACE2 expression. But that could result in unopposed angiotensin II accumulation uh, and generalized RAS activation. Um, it's known that RAS blockade limits lung injury in mice exposed to the SARS-CoV-1 spike protein. That's the envelope protein from the original uh, SARS coronavirus uh, that caused the epidemic uh, a decade ago. Um, and whether uh, a blockade of this uh, axis in uh, COVID-19 would be beneficial uh, or harmful uh, is an area of active investigation. There's considerable interest in the potential role of convalescent serum uh, in the treatment and prevention of COVID-19. Convalescent serum from survivors of COVID-19 infection might contain high titers of neutralizing antibodies. Uh, in other settings, convalescent serum has been shown to have some benefit in the treatment of avian influenza due to H1N5 uh, and in the H1N1 influenza epidemic of 2009, and has also had uh, some benefit in certain patients with MERS. A recent uncontrolled pilot study of only five participants suggested a possible benefit of uh, convalescent serum uh, in uh, patients with severe COVID-19 infection. Uh, this study that was just published in JAMA uh, showed uh, that uh, four of the five intubated patients were able to be weaned off of mechanical ventilation. And that was associated with uh, decreasing uh, titers of uh, virus in their respiratory secretions, as shown by the increasing uh, time it took for their PCR tests to uh, become positive uh, in terms of uh, cycle uh, time, resolution of a number of clinical parameters of uh, acuity, uh, improvements in their uh, oxygenation and uh, resolution of fever. There are, however, theoretical concerns that convalescent serum might contain not only neutralizing antibodies, but also enhancing antibodies. And so the use of convalescent serum could be a double-edged sword. Uh, nevertheless, there are a number of uh, clinical trials that are either uh, being planned or already underway. One of the important things to keep in mind in uh, assessing all of these interventions is that it is incredibly challenging to conduct trials of therapeutics for respiratory viral pathogens. Studies in influenza have consistently shown maximal benefit when the drug is started within the first few days after symptom onset. And that is generally because those progressing to severe infection uh, are um, uh, suffering from the immunologic consequences of infection and no longer so much from ongoing virus replication. Accelerated viral clearance from respiratory secretions by itself uh, may not correlate with faster clinical improvement. An immune-mediated lung injury is unlikely to be modified by antivirals given late in the course of disease. The availability of several candidates as approved drugs uh, that can be uh, prescribed by treating physicians also complicates the conduct of clinical trials, making it much harder to conduct studies that have a blinded placebo, uh, and uh, there needs to be careful discussion with uh, local uh, ethics boards about what is the appropriate way of proceeding uh, with these studies. Lastly, combinations of antiviral and anti-inflammatory drugs may be required for maximal benefit. Let me end with a brief discussion of uh, the potential role of some of these agents for post-exposure prophylaxis. There is considerable interest in the use of hydroxychloroquine as post-exposure prophylaxis for healthcare workers and close contacts of persons with COVID-19. Uh, we know that uh, hydroxychloroquine is reasonably safe, it's orally bioavailable, uh, bioavailable uh, and is uh, relatively inexpensive, making it uh, fairly attractive uh, for this purpose. As a result, there are now several large multicenter trials that are either already underway or uh, in late stages of uh, planning. But we have to ask, what is the relevant endpoint here? Are we attempting to merely prevent symptomatic COVID-19 infection, or do we want to prevent any uh, acquisition of SARS-CoV-2 since uh, 
uh, uh, asymptomatic infection may be uh, an important uh, uh, mechanism by which infection is spread in the community. Of course, it's much easier to uh, detect presence of symptomatic infection uh, uh, compared to detecting a carriage of virus, which requires a frequent sampling of uh, with nasopharyngeal swabs, uh, which has all kinds of complications of its own, given limitations in test availability and the need for personal protective equipment when doing a nasopharyngeal sampling. And then in this context of an ongoing pandemic, uh, is uh, prevention of uh, ex uh, infection following a single known exposure sufficient, or are we really talking about ongoing prevention, more like uh, we use PrEP, especially uh, in the setting of healthcare workers who may have a continuous and ongoing exposure to COVID. I hope uh, this uh, brief summary of uh, potential therapeutic options has been uh, helpful, and I'll turn this back over to our moderators. Thanks, Dan, um, for that wonderful talk. Uh, a couple of things. Um, We've uh, had a lot of questions about all sorts of drugs um, that might be used, but I, I just wanted to, before I, I wanted to just try and pin you down around antiretrovirals used for HIV. We've seen lapinavir, and, um, and, and then other people are using Truvada. Uh, do you think, and, and others have mentioned darunavir, ritonavir. Could you just give the audience a, 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 just a, a second or two about the utility of these drugs against uh, COVID-19 disease? I think there's no evidence whatsoever that uh, nucleoside analogs that inhibit HIV, such as uh, tenofovir or emtricitabine, have any role to play in the treatment of, uh, of uh, coronaviruses. Um, it's not unreasonable to think about exploring the use of boosted darunavir because like lopinavir, it has been shown in vitro to have some activity against certain coronaviruses. It's uh, better tolerated than lopinavir. I think another study of boosted PIs in uh, much earlier disease uh, is probably warranted given the uh, clues that we saw from the, the failed study in severe disease. And uh, so imagine I'm on an ACE inhibitor and a non-steroidal and I'm going out there as a healthcare worker, would you tell me to stop them? I think it's uh, dangerous to stop drugs that you need for uh, uh, an important medical indication, especially in the case of antihypertensives. Uh, um, there are analyses underway that uh, will hopefully be uh, uh, presented soon about uh, the relative advantages and disadvantages of continued administration of uh, ACE inhibitors or uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, so I would stay tuned for that. Uh, and I think although there's been a lot of controversy about the uh, potential harmful effects of NSAIDs, uh, of, of my own opinion, and I think the final analysis, at least from CDC and my understanding uh, coming from WHO as well, is that there's really no uh, good evidence that NSAIDs uh, are harmful in the setting of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And just uh, finally, what about corticosteroids? I mean, would you use them at any stage? You know, that becomes an issue about uh, critical care management, and uh, uh, it's, uh, that has been quite controversial. Uh, I think you don't want to use them too early so that you're not inhibiting uh, the uh, clearance of virus, but um, uh, in later stages when, uh, uh, especially as pulmonary fibrosis begins to uh, predominate uh, with acute respiratory distress syndrome, then uh, the decision to use or not use uh, corticosteroids has to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Thanks very much, Dan, for that. And we're going to talk more about therapy in our roundtable. Uh, I now hand over back to my co-chair, Alexandra. Thank you very much um, for this very interesting presentation. So uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Stefano Vella. Uh, Stefano Vella is a medical doctor specialized in infectious diseases and internal medicine. He is now the head of the pharmacology department at the Italian National Health Institute. And of course, we're very eager to hear him reporting on his clinical experience uh, in uh, the fight on COVID in Italy. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano. Hello, um, everyone. I'm Stefano Vella, and actually, I'm speaking from Sardinia. 
um, I'm here to in a COVID hospital. Um, and you know, Sardinia is not a region uh, which is most affected in Italy, um, maybe because of its insularity, and maybe because the the virus arrived here when the lockdown uh, was already in place. But the problem in Italy uh, is uh, actually very dramatic. Although other European countries are following, we were just surpassed by Spain in terms of the number of um, cases, at least the, the diagnosis, and we have around 117,000 um, COVID cases. Um, we also have uh, a high uh, death rate. The regions most affected are uh, Lombardy, Veneto, Emilia, so the north, the northern part of Italy, uh, where actually the health system is very strong and he was able to, to cope with this. Um, we have a rather um, high number of deaths uh, because we count all deaths in the COVID patients. Uh, at least the patients with COVID uh, detected, but you know the majority, the vast majority um, uh, of the death uh, are in patients over 75. Uh, so 80% of the death are there, and uh, of those, um, more than 70% have at least three comorbidities. So uh, that's the point we. We don't know if these patients die. They definitely die with uh, coronavirus, uh, but not just uh, directly uh, for coronavirus. Uh, if that, of course, they, they, they are not able to survive uh, when they are in the very so bad conditions. Uh, another important point that we discovered, but this is now known, is that uh, testing um, uh, samples of the population in, in some cities, actually we discovered that this number of COVID cases is just the tip of an iceberg. Um, it's clear now that the majority of transmissions happen in uh, asymptomatic infections. And there are um, estimates that millions are infected or have been infected. They cleared their infection. And this is actually the, the main way of transmitting the virus in, in our country, but this may be true everywhere. So uh, despite being uh, lethal in a, in a certain part of the population, the virus spreads through the asymptomatic uh, patients. And this is why we are now um, suggesting to uh, wear um, uh, the, the personal uh, protective uh, devices uh, wherever you go uh, out of your home. And that may, in a sense, have a role. We, we made a uh, in a sense, a, a common mistake at the beginning. We tested only the symptomatic, but the spread of the virus in Italy happened through the asymptomatic uh, population. And actually, we think that the virus was here maybe since December. And um, some cases were supposed to be flu, and, and the virus had many months or a couple of months to spread around before you know the measure, the containment measure uh, were uh, have been put in place. Um, what we are done, uh, doing, um, first of all, we are of course perfecting the protocols for treating the patients um, every day almost. Um, the problem is that uh, we as doctors, we do not believe that the repurposing of old drugs will work uh, 
for all, of all the patients. Uh, we are working for the new ones. Of course, top Italian centers are involved um, in different trials. Uh, I'm personally involved, uh, I'm a DCSMB member and chair of, of the, the uh, discovery trial, which is run by CERN, which uh, now merged with this Dazi trial that was launched by WHO. This is a trial that compares arms with repurposed drugs, but we are now looking at the new ones. Um, uh, and, and actually, um, we, we participate to at least um, four and uh, five national um, studies. Uh, for example, one is uh, when um, to use um, uh, tocilizumab as uh, a drug anti, you know, this is an anti interleukin 6 um, drug uh, together with, um, with uh, and we are looking at uh, when it's the what's the window of opportunity uh, to use this drug in very advanced patients. So before the catastrophe, uh, the, the, the immunological catastrophe that sometimes uh, led the patients to, to, to die. Um, we are also uh, studying other drugs. Um, uh, we are studying remdesivir, um, uh, and there are two studies on remdesivir, but of course we are also waiting for uh, for new uh, um, for new drugs. Um, we have a trial on salilumab, which is again an anti-interleukin six trial, uh, interleukin six drug, and and uh, and the, the big problem we have is also the large amount of healthcare workers that got infected. Uh, and this is a problem. Um, now it's decreasing, but we we mourn uh, actually the death of many colleagues um, here in Italy. And uh, now uh, the numbers, uh, let's say the number of new detected cases is decreasing uh, slightly. Um, but so it's it's a good, it's, it, in a sense, is a good. Um, is, is a good thing. We think that we didn't reach the, what it's called the peak, but the peak is not uh, just a peak, is maybe a, a kind of uh, long run. And so we are waiting um, for a real significant reduction in new infections before relaxing the um, social distancing measures that at the moment uh, seems to work. Uh, but it's not time to um, to stop these measures everywhere in in, in our country. Um, so uh, that's it. Uh, our uh, big problem are the number of deaths. But if you compare, if you measure now the number of deaths, and this may should be true for many countries, uh, to the supposed number of infected in the population, uh, you will see that um, the number of deaths. The proportion uh, of death will uh, actually uh, go down uh, everywhere. So we cannot count the number of deaths only on the uh, uh, on the uh, on the symptomatic, but on the overall number of infected persons. So we are struggling. Uh, it's uh, uh, in a sense the population is very uh, is locked down, and uh, we hope that will. Uh, continue to be uh, this because at the moment we are just really waiting for a new drug or new drugs. Um, I personally think that as uh, has been said by uh, Dan Kuritskas, uh, we need to have new, new drugs specific for that virus. Uh, we have many targets. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the public and private research uh, will will uh, will uh, succeed in giving us uh, the good drug uh, to help our patients. This has been done for HIV, for I'm sure 
uh, we will have the good drugs um, uh, very soon, and we hope so. Uh, so thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Stefano. It was indeed very important experience. If I would ask you one about one most pressing and urgent clinical need, what would you want to answer you to answer us? Sorry. Um, the real uh, the real clinical need would be a vaccine, but I know there are many in development, but um, it will take time. I think we need a real a real uh, um, anti anti COVID drug to be given very early in the course of the infection, uh, maybe just uh, at the detection of it, uh, so to to stop the virus to go downstairs in the in the, in the lungs. Um, um, you know, in addition to what um, Dan said, uh, we are now very interested, although um, to to you to try a drug like again, that's a repurposed drug. But I would like to ask Dan um, about ivermectin uh, because now it's very popular. It, it, the paper from the Australian looks good, um, although they used a let's say a concentration that I don't know if it's reachable um, in the humans. Uh, that was an in vitro study. And, and, and another, uh, and, and another um, question I have, sorry, I should answer questions, but I have actually questions also for Dan, is what do you think about the, the there's been a recent uh, paper on cell uh, that looks at the other uh, receptor for, for COVID. Um, which is the TMPRSS2. It looks that the virus needs both ACE2 uh, receptor and the other one. And there is a, a drug which is actually licensed in Tokyo and Japan for other uh, pathologies, which is famous bastan. It's a different word. What do you think about these possibilities? Yeah, so I think that uh, the ivermectin story is a little bit puzzling right now. It's not clear what the proposed mechanism of action would be and whether, uh, uh, as you say, uh, there are, one can achieve concentrations in people that would actually mimic those required in vitro uh, to achieve viral inhibition. Um, uh, and uh, I think exploring other entry inhibitors uh, uh, certainly makes sense. It would be very helpful to be able to make use of uh, animal models uh, uh, to help uh, decide which of these drugs should be given priority to move forward. I think that's what, to me, has been the most impressive about remdesivir is that the studies done in both the murine model and in the non-human primate model uh, really provide some evidence uh, of, uh, of success, although uh, animal models are not guarantees of success in humans. So no, no, I think I we have all uh, seen that the roundtable has started. Uh, <laughs> so, so we will continue the roundtable, but at first I would like to thank all the speakers. I think we can all realize um, how good the speaker were to address their topic. And all of this has been done in the case of emergency, of pandemic. So I really, I really would like to, to, to thank you for the quality um, of your conference. So... We will continue now on the roundtable, and I know there are already some questions. And I know, Anton, maybe you want to continue about the vaccine questions because yeah, and that's uh, Stefano, and I guess this is really a key topic now. So um, there is a vaccine in clinical uh, use at the moment, development, not use, sorry, development. And uh, I've also had quite a lot of questions come up uh, on the feed around BCG and the, the value of BCG as a, as a vaccine prospect. So uh, I wonder, maybe Anjan Viev, can, can I ask you whether or not there's, um, uh, there's any utility of any of these other vaccines we've used in the past or, and where you might think the vaccines are going? And then I might bring in uh, Jonathan and Charles about this too. Uh, well, uh, about the BCG vaccine, uh, um, 
um, there is no evidence that there, there is a direct uh, activity of the BCG vaccine on, on the virus. But I, I think the, this observation came from the difference of um, vaccination between uh, non-European uh, non people and European people, because uh, as you know, in, in France and uh, in other countries, the uh, BCG is not, uh, uh, is not recommended. And, they, and there are some observations showing that uh, people who were previously vaccinated with BCG uh, could have uh, less uh, um, COVID infection, maybe by uh, enhancing your uh, immunological response, but uh, um, I, I, I don't know if uh, Dan uh, would like to comment on, on that. Well, you know, I would be a little worried about using BCG in this context. Uh, in other settings, such as when it's used for cancer therapy as an immune adjuvant or booster, the idea is to uh, activate the immune system. And given what we know about the pathogenesis of uh, COVID-19 and the second and third phases of disease that are really based mostly on inf inflammation and then a hyperimmune response, uh, I think maybe activating the immune system is the wrong approach. Yeah, well, I, I agree with that. Uh, any other comments around BCG? Because, all right, I'd like to just ask uh, um, about this immune dysfunction, uh, Dan, that you've just spoken about, and, and, uh, and maybe I could first ask Elliot uh, about the CD4, CD8 dysfunction, and this may be pertinent to HIV patients, but it seems like these patients get very low lymphocyte counts, and CD4 and CD8 are really important. Yeah, well, as you know, you and I have been talking about this, and there's been a lot of discussion in the, you know, in the world right now about what is the relative um, uh, susceptibility to and, and to serious outcomes from infection among persons with HIV. And so, because the clinicians have observed, clinicians have observed this drop in lymphocyte count that, um, at least the last I saw, has been characterized. As, as not any specific subset, but sort of a, a uh, cross the board drop. Um, whether that leads to, you know, an associated, let's say, um, enhancement of immunosuppression in an HIV infected person. And, you know, it, 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 that's a really hard question to answer. Um, but, but certainly, you know, we, we, as everyone has been saying, we need to operate as if having HIV is, is a risk and having controlled HIV is a risk. Or having uncontrolled HIV is a risk, and, and having advanced infection obviously is a risk. I, what's interesting is we are we are seeing in the United States, and, and actually I heard today even in Africa that people known to be infected with HIV who are not on treatment are actually now seeking treatment because of this notion that controlled HIV might be a, a protective factor, at least for them as a single. Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, I can, yeah, uh, yeah, Alexandra. I would like to comment on the on, on, on the HIV side. So um, in in Switzerland, as you may know, we have a very important epidemic. We are the second largest uh, epidemic country in Europe, after, just after Italy, uh, and now Spain. Um, we have had a COVID hospital for nearly three weeks, uh, with nearly a thousand <coughs> hospitalized, and we had only five patients with HIV. Um, of course, in, in Switzerland, uh, we have reached the 1990-90 targets for HIV. So most of the patients, uh, HIV positive patients, uh, do uh, have a treatment. But that also raised for me the, the one issue that you mentioned, Elliot, before. The patients who were hospitalized with HIV were older patients and they had comorbidities. So the role of HIV in their um, disease course is really uh, difficult to say. I, I would say most probably it's the comorbidities and age that were um, conducting their, their disease course. So this is one point. The second point is some patients on boosted PIs, especially on darinavir, we have quite a lot of patients on darinavir, they had kept uh, asking us whether they were protected from COVID-19 uh, disease. Um, we always said, no, you're probably not protected, but to be really honest, we don't really know the, the, the answer of this. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't want them to think that they can run in the streets and go to restaurants. Uh, but certainly this is something we have to, we would like to have the answer to. So the most we can uh, uh, have all those data together and, and have uh, or 
HIV cohort patients um, together in order to uh, answer those questions the most we will be able to maybe reassure our patients but also to offer some other drugs to the one who are really at risk so this is just something I wanted to say about HIV because for the ones um, it seems that for the one who treated we, uh, we do not see an epidemic of very, very sick patients uh, living with HIV in our hospital, at least in Geneva now, uh, where we really have a large number of patients hospitalized with, with COVID. Yeah, yeah we're seeing, we're, we're, we have similar experience and we're trying to collect the data through the NEAT network. Uh, Dan, um, what's it like there for HIV? And then maybe I can ask Stefano about, about these issues. Yeah, I, I agree with Alexandra that uh, we're really not seeing any uh, unique uh, incidents or manifestations, uh, at least not of the that, not that have been noticed so far among our HIV infected population. Uh, it's been principally uh, older people and people with the comorbidities that have been described in other studies. Uh, um, you know, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, particularly. I think the other uh, category that seems to be missing so far, but I, I think we need more data, is it doesn't appear that people who are on immunosuppressive therapies for rheumatologic disease are uh, appearing in greater numbers than you might expect. Um, uh, it could be different for people who are on cancer chemotherapy, people who have undergone stem cell transplant who are severely immunosuppressed. Um, but um, I think uh, the, the you know people with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and I'm not speaking about those on on hydroxychloroquine, but on on some of the monoclonal antibody therapies, we're not seeing huge numbers of those. Now a lot of those patients, though, they they uh, isolated themselves yeah. very early on, yeah. and it may be that the exposure risk to them has been much less. Yeah. Stefano, what in Italy uh, did you see a lot of um, no, HIV no, patients? No, it's the same. Um, we we don't have a lot. Uh, of um, uh, HIV patients infected, and the reasons may be that they 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 stayed more isolated. Maybe I have a question for actually for Heliot because one thing that is now happening in Italy is that in in some regions of the north they are testing the they are doing a sampling testing of an, an entire city, and they discovered that 60 percent hmm. were positive and they have never had a symptom so we this is in a sense critical in terms of the transmission because this asymptomatic state that it seems that it it, it stays like that they are not pre uh, preclinical patients they were just totally asymptomatic but they were uh, definitely infected, and we know that they they could have spread this. So, in this, epidemiologically, this is a, in a sense a little disaster. What do you think, Elio? It's not a disaster because maybe they are immune, so they may, 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 maybe half of this little city is protected if they have the neutralizing antibody. So, in a sense, it's a good thing on a population basis, but we need to understand that the transmission. Uh, uh, of the virus uh, is different from what we thought before. Is it correct? Yeah, I mean, I agree. And I think Anjanib might want to also weigh in on this, but you know, the, the light, I mean, if you, if you are able to detect PCR in someone by PCR and someone COVID by PCR and someone who has never had any history of, you know, any kind of symptomatic disease, then I would certainly Agree that that suggests a large a large population of um, asymptomatic infection, and by virtue of the fact that they have positive PCR, you also have to assume some source of, of um, transmission, even if it maybe isn't as efficient a transmission as you get, like in hospital infections, for example. So, so I think that um, I think I was thinking during your presentation how important it is to do the proper. Um, epidemiologic studies to answer all these questions. So you, you know, that, 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 you know, you were leaning towards, but you, but like any scientist, you want more information and so do we. But I think the, the combination of PCR sampling and serologic studies and understanding whether uh, those antibodies are um, neutralizing and protective or not, which obviously will impact the vaccine work too, um, are all sort of need to be part of the picture and we can't 
we can't just jump into conclusions until we've done those proper oh, absolutely studies. absolutely but even in the middle where, of all this chaos absolutely no the, the studies were done in a small cities both with rna and antibodies and actually this was and some some mathematic mathematicians or modelists uh, predicted that we have million of infected uh, already that yeah. passed the infection. So I don't know if this is good or not. We, it need to be confirmed, but uh, in, a, in a sense, we need to rethink at the epidemiological situation of this um, pandemic. Well, can I can I just then ask uh, Angevier, it for example, key workers like medical workers, etc. If they've been exposed and been asymptomatic and have antibodies, what, do you think they should be allowed to then um, work without so much protection on board? I mean, to have to do all of this uh, for, to look after pay, the general public and the patients. And what, and, and, and what I'm, tr I'm really trying to get at how useful is serology to get out of this lockdown that many countries are in? Uh, what's, so, so Stefano's just said a whole town's been tested and they found out what's gone on but how are we going to to use um a serology in getting out of lockdown because at the moment getting out of lockdown like in wuhan means no more cases but we don't know if there's going to be secondary epidemic or whatever else so i, I don't know if that's answerable but i'd like your opinion <laughs> no i think I, I have not the answer but uh um i really think that these uh, in serology uh, epidemiologic studies will will be very important to, to perform uh, rapidly, to have the, an idea of the uh, circulation of the virus, uh, to, um, to, to make some modelization for the, um, for the when we, we have to um, um, uh, remove the isolation. And we, we don't have the answer because if, if the, the antibodies are very low in the population, may, maybe we, we have to think of, of, of the strategy to um, to to keep uh, to keep uh, off this uh, isolation. And for and for example, in my uh, in my hospital, we have a, a lot of healthcare workers, uh, healthcare workers um, who ask for serology to to know if they are been in contact. Uh, some of them were symptomatic. Uh, some of them were not. But uh, we have a lot of pressure to develop this test to, to give them an answer and to, 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 to say them if they are, if they are uh, have antibodies or not. Okay. Okay. I, 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 I don't think you can equal antibodies to protection. Uh, we have done some studies, small studies, but it shows that the amount of potential neutralizing antibodies varies considerably among individuals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah you, you're right. You're right, Charles. It, it does uh, to have antibodies does not mean uh, you are protected, but uh, um, you, 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 at least you know that you have been in contact at, uh, with yes. the virus, and and you had uh, an as you were asymptomatic or yes. But uh, I, I do think that soon we will have antibodies that can uh, we will have tests that can measure antibodies that are neutralizing even elisa's using the s1 antigen so I, I think in a matter of weeks we will have a much better understanding yeah. hmm. about the, the neutralizing status of people in relation to what disease and the severity of disease etc cetera, etc cetera. but do so, you so think there will be a risk of antibody enhanced disease um, such as in dengue, for example, because that is really then important for these healthcare workers that have been exposed, for example, for corona to coronavirus in the current epidemic. Um, do you think, for example, if you do vaccine them or if they are re-exposed to the disease, are they taking a risk? I think that's a possible risk. I, I think, you know, one of the issues about um, the uh, seroprevalence in healthcare workers is that to some extent, it really tells you what the adequacy of uh, personal protective equipment was and how effectively mm. it has been used. In some studies uh, that have been done, certainly in the SARS era and, and even more recently now with COVID-19, uh, there have been uh, zero surveys where none of the healthcare workers have zero converted um, because they uh, are 
really very effectively uh, protected, although it's very clear that uh, uh, workplace transmission can certainly occur. Yeah, well, when, when we did, we were in the early days of the epidemic when we analyzed the viral sequences of healthcare workers, they didn't match the patients they were taking care of. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the healthcare workers were actually uh, infected outside. outside. Yes, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, you know, uh, important. It's, it's very important, that fact, because um, it's a lot of healthcare workers have been very worried about going to work, whereas maybe their major risk is from their own environment and people that they meet uh, mm -hmm. rather than where they're very protected at work, where they follow the whole thing. I just wanted to finish really the round table because uh, I, I'm sorry that we haven't got half the evening because we've had nearly 400 questions about a question that keeps coming up and it, Dan, it's, it's about the role of zinc. So I'd like to end, end uh, for, for everybody to hear whether, whether or not you think there's a role of zinc either with hydroxychloroquine or by itself. I mean, there is a, a body of evidence to show that zinc is useful and it's cheap and it's easy, it's available, it's in lots of food. What, what do you think about zinc? Yeah. Uh, not very much. Um, zinc, zinc has been proposed for uh, quite a number of different viruses. It was even at one point suggested for HIV, and then it was realized that uh, you know, uh, zinc plays an important role as a cofactor in some of the viral regulatory proteins, the zinc finger proteins, right? So um, I, I would uh, stick to uh, more mechanistically based therapies. But, but what about in combination with hydroxychloroquine? Uh, I don't see why you would expect better activity of, uh, of, of hydroxychloroquine by adding zinc. Because um, uh, I thought it let the zinc um, into, the, into the cellular lysosome. But, um, yeah, I just don't think that zinc is really going to have much of an effect. I, okay. I was, I, it's good because I, I, it's interesting to ask these questions because there are so many of these things around with very little evidence or data mm -hmm. or with not even a basis to start from. But, um, uh, it's about, so I'm very grateful for your opinion on that because I get asked a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I think we will close the round table right now. Um, I would like to, to really thank the, 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 the speakers. Um, as I said, it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to prepare such a conference uh, in, in the current times. Um, and I would like to give back the floor to Anton to wrap up some of the main messages of, of this uh, conference and also thank the organizers for the time this, they spent um, to make uh, the script of, of this conference. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alexandra. And I'd like to thank the faculty um, uh, for the, the talks, fantastic talks, and also for the round table um, and for putting the program together and all the people behind the scenes, uh, Wilco, Roy, and the team for putting this on. And, and mainly for all of you to take your, some time out of your uh, very busy days, fighting the COVID epidemic, supporting friends and family, and trying to get on with our lives to, to listen to this. Um, we're going to have uh, an, another edition of this. It'll be planned, so, so stay tuned. We hope in the next couple of weeks we'll be able to get another one of these out. It's really important, however, that following this stream there's an evaluation, if you can complete this, uh, and so that we can focus the program to your needs um, because uh, uh, we had lots and lots of questions whereby we, we tried to answer most of them, but not all. So there's, uh, we could see from that there's a lot of need in terms of exchanging information. So with that, I'd like to thank my co-chair, Alexandra, for um, uh, steering this through with me. And I'd like to wish you all well and stay safe. Good night, goodbye, good evening. Goodbye, bye. Thank you, bye. good night. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.